to School Britannia, the podcast where two Aussies teach Brits their own history. This is my friend Claire. And this is my friend Ellie. We've been going to lots of amazing history events around town lately and getting heaps of inspiration for the podcast. So many great events. We went to a really cool talk by the uh, Royal College College of of Physicians. Physicians. Mm -hmm. Edinburgh branch. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, about the plague in Florence yeah. and the quarantines that they put in place. What were they called? The L- Lazzaretti or something? Yeah. I'm we took gonna notes. Try. <laughs> <laughs> Saying that. Uh, yeah, the like plague houses they built for people who Just were infected mad. to live in. Yeah, and, and the like, systems they had for feeding everyone. Yes! They had these like massive stores of food that the city, I guess, would pay for, and then they used to yeah. take them to all the houses of infected no, people. No, remember, people had to go and get them, but oh. only men over 15. Yeah. And if you didn't have a man over 15 in your house, you just hope a neighbour would get it through for you, which was just like, oh, ugh. Because patriarchy. Yeah, of course. Ugh. Like, you know, boobs get in the way of going to pick up food, apparently. That's, that's what I found. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, a, real it's a real It's a burden. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we also went to a fantastic talk about the history of Stevenson's Lighthouses by the Northern Lighthouse Board which we are very excited to maybe talk about a bit more yes, soon because lighthouses are just the best. Yeah, I'm a big I fan. didn't realise how cool they were. I mean, yeah. like aesthetically, I was like, whatever, that's yeah. awesome. But I didn't – the history is really fascinating. It's mad. And some of them, they're like built on rocks in the mm. middle of the ocean and they were built in the early 19th century. Can you imagine like going out into the middle of the ocean to build – a, a lighthouse that will withstand the North Sea. I'm not comfortable going out to the ocean now. <laughs> <laughs> and you haven't built any lighthouses exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very much looking forward to talking more about that. Yes, keep an ear out for that one. So what will you be teaching us about today, Claire? Well, Ellie. Yes. As you may know, it was recently the... First of May. Yes. <laughs> was it? Which is oh my also, God. Yeah. Have you not looked at the calendar lately? <laughs> which is also known as May Day. Yes. Which is a lot to do with um, workers', workers rights. rights and protests and unions. It has its own whole deep history that I could never, ever cover in like an episode of this podcast. <laughs> but it did get me thinking about various union movements mm-hmm. and workers' rights protests. Amazing. And I kind of went even further back to some early ones. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to tell you about the Luddite Rebellions. Yes. So exciting. it has the alternative title of How Technological Advancement Helps the Rich at the Expense of the Working Class or Fuck Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> My other favourite C word to rant about. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hang on, what's the first C word? Uh, colonialism. Oh. <laughs> Good. I'm glad we've got that ironed out. <laughs> just, just make that clear. <laughs> so, the Luddite Rebellions were a series of industrial protests from 1811 to 1813. Wow, it's so specific. Yeah, so the time span can kind of be made broader if you take into account like other events that were sort of part of the rebellion, mm-hmm. but the height of it was those couple of years wow. when events were specifically done by people identifying as Luddites. Okay. Yeah. So it was a group of textile workers in the north of England who went around destroying textile equipment in protest of manufacturers who use machines in what they called, quote, a fraudulent and deceitful manner Mm. to get around standard labor practices. Mm, What does that mean? Well, the biggest takeaway and the most important thing you need to know about Luddites is they were not anti-technology. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Because that's what I think of when I think of Luddites. Yeah, of course. Which is, like, it's fine. I mean, if you're in a conversation and you use the term Luddite and everyone knows what you're talking about, fine. Mm -hmm. But it is important to know that (laughs) Luddites were not against technology. Okay. They were against the misuse of technology to the disadvantage of workers. Okay. Yes. So... That's the crucial point. They... Because all the Luddites used textile machinery. Yeah, right. The machines weren't new. It's just they were being used in a new way by like mill owners yeah to undercut workers oh. so this is the beginning of like the real industrial revolution yeah okay the, yeah the kick up of the industrial yeah revolution. when it becomes like serious factory work mm. kind of thing when we really started global warming just yeah really yeah cranked up it up dial <laughs> yeah so for some context yes So before the rebellion, this is what the world was like. There was an emerging working class community coming up all around the world Mm -hmm. that were radicalized by the French Revolution that happened in 1789 and also radicalized by the works of writers like Thomas Mm Paine, a.k.a. founding father Thomas Paine, 
who wrote The Rights of Man. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this was, like, sort of towards the end of the Age of Enlightenment and mm. their whole interest in, like, transnational human rights. Mm, so that's yeah, cool. what he was talking about a lot. So that was in the air at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Luddite Rebellion took place in the North, where there are a lot of pro-Jacobean groups operating <gasps> in secret. Whoa. So people were already kind of radicalized. Yeah. And they already liked the stabby stabby and the shooty shooty. <laughs> <laughs> well, more the standing up for our own rights. Okay. Like, yeah. 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 That's how I like to think of it anyway. Yeah. Um, and in the first decade of the 19th century, the cloth trades were depressed due to war with France. Ah. So, like, a Because lot of the port- French people weren't buying cloth. English cloth. cloth. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. Um, and there was poor harvests that led to food riots in the north of England at the time. Mm-hmm. And in the period before 1811, there was a bunch of petitions to Parliament asking for help for starving, weaving, and framework knitting communities Aww. that were just ignored by Tory governments. Oh, no. Classics. Yes. This was also the time of something called the enclosures. Oh, yes. Yes. So enclosures were a system of privatizing land that had originally been used by local communities for grazing and foraging purposes. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, so it was sort of like publicly owned land Mm -hmm. that wasn't kind of arable enough to be owned by the like big local manor, Mm -hmm. but wasn't kind of crown land either. It was literally public land that anyone could use. Like the village green. Yes. And you could plant crops there, but you had to, there was all these rules about like you had to plant them in the night so you couldn't be caught planting them and stuff like that. Yes. Wow. So you technically, wow. Yeah. And you could put up a dwelling on common land, but Uh you had to again do it overnight. (laughs) Yeah. It's <laughs> so funny. Yeah. But Wow, um, so it was like a uh, don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, just, it was just yeah, it was like it was just to stop people taking ty- advantage taking over of the taking over the, taking yeah, the land themselves. Okay. But yeah. But you could do that at night. That yeah, you could grow so you could grow crops, you could forage for food, you could um get firewood from it, yeah. and you could graze animals. Okay. And I read a book that said something like you could almost double the income of an impoverished family through Whoa. foraging and grazing and stuff. Oh on my goodness. Enclosure, enclose, uh, what, what land became, became enclosed. Mm. So that had this huge impact because it forced a lot of people from smaller communities into larger cities to look for work. So there was this influx of mm. both unskilled laborers and skilled laborers who no longer had this setup of working at home mm-hmm. with the addition of foraged and grown food to supplement their income mm-hmm. because it was such a huge important part of feeding yeah. your family. So a lot of them upped and moved to the city, but also were angry that their way of life was being yeah. completely destroyed. Yeah. Fair yeah. Enough. So the enclosures are very complex and have their own whole deep other history. Thing. Yeah. yeah. But that was the north of England at the time. Okay. Amazing. Yes. Set the scene. Yes. Fabulous. <laughs> so back to the Luddites themselves. Okay. So as I said, most important thing, they were not opposed to technology. They would have liked an iPod. <laughs> they would have. Yeah, yeah, probably. Except they would have been really grossed out by all of the small Chinese children working. Oh, yeah, them. totally. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, because they were textiles workers, they all worked on machines themselves. Okay. Very important. Yeah. Remember. Um. Kevin Binfield, editor of the 2004 collection Writings of the Luddites, Mm -hmm. says the Luddites themselves, quote, were totally fine with machines. Great. (laughs) I just just love the phrasing. (laughs) Yeah, we're totally fine with it. Totally fine with machines. It's fine. Uh, Yeah. So they were opposed to the economic and political changes that were eroding the existing social contract between Mm. workers and masters Mm. that prescribed the customary wages that had been maintained by tradition over many decades. Okay. Yes. So working conditions in these big mills that were cropping up were efficient. Like, so they created a lot of product Mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm. expense of laborers, but that really threatened the livelihood of all these skilled artisans. Uh Aha. Okay. So these new inventions and these new machines and this new way of producing stuff was faster and cheaper because the machines were operated by less skilled, low wage laborers. Mm -hmm. And the Luddite's goal was to gain a better bargaining position with these employers. Okay. Yes. All right. Because pre-industrial revolution, yeah. the textile industry in the UK was focused around cottage industry mm-hmm. with much of the work carried out by women. Yeah. And as the UK's cotton industry and later other textiles grew, the balance between like men and women working in the industry shifted mm-hmm. between skilled and unskilled labor. Okay. As well. All right. So it became more unskilled men working in factories versus skilled women working in small cottage industries at home. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So one of the technologies the Luddites commonly attacked was the stocking frame, which was a knitting machine first developed more than 200 years earlier 
by an Englishman named William Lee. But from the very beginning, people saw how that would impact these small cottage industries. Mm -hmm. And Queen Elizabeth I denied him a patent. Wow. Yeah, because they were worried how it would displace traditional hand knitters. Huh. And you would be left with this huge swathe of people who were overskilled and unemployed. Yeah, right. Yeah. But eventually his frame was, like, adjusted and taken up and progress marched on. Just to recap. So yes. they weren't anti-technology. No. So how did they see artisans working with machines? Like, they were artisans themselves they were. working with machines. Oh, I yes. see. That is why they weren't opposed to machinery itself. Okay. they were themselves the artisans. Okay. The Luddites are all of these at-home um like skilled knitters mm -hmm. working on a small machine that they would have at home. Okay. And so the setup was you would have like a kind of master in your area who would give you piecework to do and you would take it mm. home to do. Okay. Yes. So they were opposed to industrialization of yes. labor. Because you got paid a lot less and the working hours were horrific yeah. and the conditions were horrific. Yeah. So you would go from working your own hours, your own pace in your own home yeah. to working 12 hours straight in a factory with no OHS. Right. Yes. Okay, I think I understand. I can't remember if it's like Marx, but like in the Communist Manifesto, like you, as a worker, yeah. you have to have control over the means of production. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely right. You can't just be no a cog. longer. Yeah, this is them becoming the cog. Yeah. So before this, people had control. Yeah, right. And this was them realizing they were losing that control yes. to these big factories. Okay, I yeah. understand. So, have you ever heard of Harris Tweed? Yes, I have heard of Harris Tweed. They run the way people who became Luddites, who so skilled artisans, <gasps> that used to company run. is currently run, and Harris Tweed <sighs> is currently made the way people used to make textiles right. in the UK. So, you will have like a central kind of master or like central now company mm -hmm. who will coordinate Commission. so that you're all making the same thing. Uh -huh. So, you're all working with the same color and the same design, but everyone will be in their own home making their own thing mm -hmm. and that's why it's so good yes but so I mean, expensive yes because it's all handmade so you do get a more skilled more finely crafted Product, thing yeah but it's more expensive because that's when you mm. break production down that way yeah you have to pay people a lot more but then you're but, paying people more exactly and probably it lasts longer too yeah it's so well made it's, yeah really high quality yeah so mm. that's a modern example <clears throat> but there's not a lot of it happening these days mm. So, in Yorkshire, the Luddites were led by croppers, who were highly skilled finishers of woolen cloth, mm -hmm. and they commanded this really high wage, and they were really highly organised, which was really helpful. And for, like, the past decade, they had been petitioning Parliament to enforce this obsolete legislation that enforced apprenticeships, Ooh. and had been kind of petitioning against, quote-unquote, gig mills. Whoa! It's the gig economy! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Everything has already happened before, Whoa. Eleanor, which I will get to. Gee. Um, so they were also petitioning against these gig mills, which were machines invented in the 16th century that could do part of their job. Uh -huh. um, but the greatest threat to them was a more recent invention, the hated shearing frame, mm. which eventually almost entirely displaced them over the next 10 years. That sounds dangerous to sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't how they're involved it's in like this protest. Wallace and Gromit episode. <laughs> they go into the machine. <laughs> oh, poor she oh, poor she um, but in 1809, under pressure from the manufacturers, Parliament repealed this old apprenticeship legislation and removed the artisans' last hope of redress for their grievances mm. by legal or democratic means. <sighs> so the government was very against supporting artisans mm -hmm. and were very pro supporting Industry. the capitalist masters who mm. owned all the mills mm -hmm. and Probably yes, they were mates. yes. Mm. So the reason they're called Luddites okay. is because of a fictional character <gasps> called Ned Ludd. What? Yes. Who is Ned Ludd? This blew my mind. He was said to be a stockinger from Leicester, who in 1779 was told off by a superior for knitting too loosely. And in response, he grabbed a hammer and just flattened his stocking frame. Oh, I thought you were going to say something <laughs> so much worse. Flattened the master, as I wow. would have done. No, so he, he flattened destroyed. his stocking frame in protest. He was hey. like, too loose for you, mate? Take this. Yeah, this is loose. Yeah. <laughs> Um, try getting a tight knit now, bitch, and just <laughs> smashed it. And so people, I think, would sort of spread this story over the next couple of decades as a like, 
Wow. You like go Ned Ludd and there's someone out there standing up for the little guy. And, Good Ned Ludd. Yeah. But oh. it kind of took on this life of its own. And when people started protesting against industrialization, they turned Ned into their symbolic leader and called him General Ned and said that he lived in Sherwood Forest. Oh, Robin yes. Hood. Yeah, well, they played on the whole Robin Hood mythology and they had this little chant that went, Chant no more your old rhymes about bold Robin Hood. His feats I but little admire. I will sing the achievements of General Ludd, now the hero of Nottinghamshire. Oh, <laughs> I love I that. that. And they would even write letters and declarations from this General Ludd. And it seemed like the British government kind of thought he was actually a real person. Because <laughs> they were always like, oh, no, we're doing this under orders of General Ludd. Oh, no, we've got to do it because General Ludd told us. Wow, they have such a sense of humour. Yeah, they were... Um, an article I read from the Smithsonian magazine talked about the fact that they had really great PR. Yeah. So people have been smashing frames for ages. Uh-huh. Like, that, this was not the beginning of frame smashing as a form of protest <laughs> or machine destruction as a form of protest. Yeah. But the Luddites had really good branding. Yeah. So they would apparently dress up in women's clothes. Like, Ned Ludd was considered a cross-dresser. Like, yeah, literally right. in the sense that he was... A man presented as a man, but would wear women's clothing. Right. And there are even illustrations of him dressed in women's clothing. Huh. Is that so he could get into factories? No idea. Were... It seemed to just kind of be for a lark. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Great. Yep. Into it. <laughs> so often his followers would dress up in women's clothing and like practice marching on moors. Oh, because it's tricky in a dress. Yeah, I don't know. It just sort of seemed to be to confuse and scare the government and the military. <laughs> Yes, because disrupting gender norms does scare people of authority. It does seem to, Mm. yes. Um, So there was no national organisation of the Luddites, but they were more organised than previous instances of industrial rebellion. Mm. And they were technically a secret organisation that made new members swear an oath upon joining. Do you have the oath? I do! (laughs) (laughs) So I'm sure there were lots of variations of this because, like I said, no central organisation. But here is a oath by a Luddite. I, A.B., of my own free will and accord, do hereby promise and swear that I will never reveal any of the names of any one of this secret committee under the penalty of being sent out of this world by the first brother that may meet me. Oh, God. I furthermore do swear that I will pursue with unceasing vengeance any traitors or traitor, (sighs) should there any arise, should he fly to the verge of something. (laughs) handwritten it was very hard to oh, yeah. <laughs> i furthermore do swear that i will be sober and faithful in Aww. all my dealings with all my brothers and Aww. if i ever decline them my name to be blotted out from the list of society <gasps> and never to be remembered but with contempt and abhorrence so help me god to keep this our oath inviolate wow Invi- inviolate inviolate like inviolate. Un- unviolated yes ah, signed wow. thomas brought nice yeah they were real they're pretty serious about it um so and someone had clock yeah if yeah. You, wow. Yeah, you'd be dead. <laughs> I don't know how many Luddites killed other Luddites. I never found that out. Um, but they would meet at night on the outskirts of industrial towns Ooh. to plan, and their tactic was to warn manufacturers to remove the frames from the premises. And if oh. they refused, then they would go in with sledgehammers and break them at night. Oh, okay. They gave them a chance. Yeah, they gave them a chance. They went in at night when there would be no other workers there because they weren't, again, opposed to people mm, they were opposed working. to yes they were opposed to industrialization yes um so their main areas of operation began in nottinghamshire in november 1811 and yorkshire in january 1812 mm-hmm. and these nighttime raids were highly successful in destroying frames in smaller workshops and also at stopping them from being captured Ooh. yes the Manchester, a warehouse of a manufacturer who used power looms, was burned down in early February 1812. Power, uh, power loom. <laughs> <laughs> like hardcore knitting. <laughs> um, however, resistance from some of the larger mill owners, supported by magistrates, was stronger in Yorkshire. Mm. So the most famous attack by around 100 men on... Wow. Yeah. They were, there was a lot of people yeah. who were very angry. Um, was on William Cartwright's Rawfolds Mill in April 1812. Rawfolds Mill? Yes. What's a Rawfolds Just the name mill? of the mill. It's oh, not, okay, yeah, yeah. sorry. They all have names because... Yeah. Yeah, yes. why not? Um, but it was unsuccessful because Cartwright was aware of the Luddites' plan. I don't know if it's because they did that thing where they warned him or oh, if he yeah. heard about it some other way. Uh-huh. And so it was thwarted. 
Oh, no. Yes. So the government hadn't been able to actually, like, infiltrate any of the Luddite organizations because they were so grassroots and they mm-hmm. operated only in their local area mm-hmm. and everyone was known to each mm-hmm. other, so you couldn't really... Infiltrate. Yeah. yeah. And also, a lot of the small master hojas supported their stocking as demands because mm-hmm. they were basically middle management and they would be cut out if this right. factory system of happened. Course. Because the factory was basically, like, owner workers that was the hierarchy yeah so they refused to give up the names of luddites the authorities so when the attack on cartwright's mill happened they just sent in the troops like a lot of troops Uh, a lot of troops considering that britain was still at war with france yeah at one point there were more troops in the north fighting the luddites than on the iberian peninsula fighting napoleon oh my god that's how much the government hated the luddites do you know how many troops? I couldn't get a number, That's just mad. a lot. And we really fucking hated Napoleon, so yeah. <laughs> I imagine a lot. Which I think was because they couldn't infiltrate them. They had no idea what any of them were doing or planning. They just Sent swamped the them army. with troops. My god, that's mad. Yeah, because they were more interested in protecting property than people. Yeah. <laughs> so gross. Yeah. Oh no, so what happened? Well, as you can imagine, oh. lots of troops meant people got killed. Oh no. Yeah, at Rawfold's Mill, so the Cartwright Mill, two Luddites were killed by soldiers, which only angered the Luddites more, yeah. and for the first time they decided to attempt an assassination. Wow. Yeah, so they targeted William Horfell, the owner of the large Otterswell Mill in oh. West Yorkshire, who had said that he would, quote, ride up to his saddle in Luddite blood. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's so that's why they awful. chose him. Yeah, fair. Yeah, so three Luddites, led by George Meller, attacked him, and Meller fired the fatal shot into his groin. Oh my god, they got and him! They killed him. In the groin? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Hit that femoral artery and you are gone. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the government decided that they would do a mass trial of Luddites in the hopes that that would suppress the rebellion. A mass trial? A mass trial. Jeez. So in York, in 1813, they tried several people involved in the Rawfolds Mill attack and the three men arrested for killing William Horfell. Uh-huh. They also just tried heaps of people. There were dozens. A lot of them were just rumoured to be Luddites and maybe were, maybe weren't. God. It was all a bit of a farce. Yeah. So the three men involved in the murder and 14 others were hanged. Oh my God, 14 others who just weren't in... For destruction (gasps) of property. Which didn't even occur because no one made it into the Rawfolds Mill, as far as I can tell, because the troops showed up. Oh, no. So they hanged 14 oh, people. God. 17, including the three men. Mm. And then a bunch of others were sent to Australia as punishment. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> hopefully they had a good time once Yeah, that makes got sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, because, sorry, how many got sent to Australia? Just others. Okay. Right. <laughs> Make of that what you will. <laughs> But Parliament had made machine-breaking, i.e. industrial sabotage, a capital crime with the Frame-Breaking Act of 1812, which is why they were able to hang them. Because, like, there were already lots of laws in place making, like, what the Luddites were doing criminal acts. Mm -hmm. But this one specifically introduced the death penalty for frame-breaking, which is what the Luddites were doing. They really hated them. They really hated them. But someone didn't hate them. You know who didn't hate them? Lord Byron. I love Lord Byron! (laughs) Yeah, he was. So he was a Yorkshire landowner. I didn't know that. He owned heaps of land up north, but he was really supportive of the Luddites and he gave this speech in Parliament in support of them. Oh. It was a quite a racist speech, oh. but very supportive oh no. of the Luddites. Does he talk about slaves? No, he was basically just like, well, I've been to Turkey and they have poor people, but like when I came home, I saw that we had even worse poor people. How <laughs> shocking is that? Good job, Byron. Yeah, and I was just like, that's a false equivalency based on some really racist notions. But it's good that you can acknowledge there are problems at home You're that need bitch. to be addressed. Yeah. <laughs> I think he had a bit of a thing about Turkey because he was really into Greece and yeah. Greek independence. So he might have been extra down on Turkey. Yeah. Because of his Just particular interest. It's a dick move. But it's, I'm like, wow. he could have been supportive without slacking off Turkey. Yeah, he really could have. Yeah. But he was like literally the only person in government wow. who stood up and said... Uh, but no, <laughs> what yeah. are you doing? This is terrible. We shouldn't be opposing the Luddites and we shouldn't be murdering them. Yeah. But, I mean, he gave a great speech, but it didn't change anything. Just one guy. Yeah, which is, like, it's good. Like, mm. it's nice that someone in a position of power said yeah. something. Yeah. But. Not enough. No. So, by the end of the uprising, because those mass trials did have a surprisingly big impact. <laughs> yeah, can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, apparently thousands of frames, which was a significant portion of the total number in England, had been smashed. 
I couldn't really find anything on what actual impact this had on, you know, industrialization yeah. or on mills or anything, but they did break some frames, that, which is what they set out to do. <laughs> so yeah. they achieved that. And so although organized Luddism ended in 1813, <laughs> there were still sporadic attacks of machines breaking out over the following few years. Yeah. And in the 1830s, the south of England saw similar protests against threshing machines, Aha. known as the swing riots, done by agricultural workers. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, to the legacy of our dear friends, the Luddites. Yes. <laughs> so, in the immediate future, the failure of the Luddite rebellion eventually led to full-scale industrial revolution of the 19th century. Mm. I'm guessing that, like me, at some point in your youth, someone was like, hey, you like reading Jane Austen. Here's this book, North and South by Elizabeth yes, Gaskell, which is like Pride say... and Prejudice, but with a social conscience. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So basically it went full North and South <laughs> with people working in shit mills, breathing in cotton Terrible fluff. Air. Yeah. Working 12 hours a day, being hugely impoverished. Yeah. And that's exactly what the Luddites were afraid of. And it mm, happened. Yeah. So the demand for cheap labor and the enclosure system that I mentioned before mm. drove people to larger cities, especially in the north, because mm. that's where all the coal was. So that's where industrialization started in England. Okay, yeah. So they went there to work in factories for long hours and small wages. Um, apparently this time underemployment was chronic and it was common practice to retain a larger workforce than was typically necessary <sighs> for insurance against labor shortages in boom times. Like zero hour contracts. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, I know. <laughs> Happening just, even then. For our Australian <laughs> listeners, a zero-hour contract is something that happens in the UK where you can technically Awful. be employed by a business, but they don't have to give you any hours. But then because they can also turn around and be like, you're working 40 hours this week. Yeah. If you're not available for those 40 hours, you're we fired. can fire you. Yeah, it's terrible. They're awful. Um, so even though piecework and the cottage industry was far from the idyllic bucolic lifestyle that it's sometimes painted as, mm. the strength with which people resisted the industrial system is a measure of how much better it was compared mm. to the harsh new mm -hmm. world of factory wage slavery. Yeah. 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 Like, absolutely. The fact that they were going around smashing up things, getting hung for their actions yeah. because they believed in it so strongly shows how much people did not want to slave away in factories no. for 12 hours a day yeah. from the age of six. Yeah. Yeah. And lose their fingers in the machine. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, have gross, terrible awful diseases life. from terrible health and safety practices. And also, like... It seems like the smallest concern, but no joy in your work. Yeah. Like, absolutely yes. Absolutely no pleasure. And going from a system where you had extreme joy in your work yeah. and you were a skilled or at least, artisan you know, and respected for yeah. your work. Yeah. Even if it wasn't fun all the time, you, yeah. you make the thing. There was you satisfaction know, in doing yeah. a job well done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in 1867, Karl Marx wrote that it would be some time before workers were able to distinguish between the machines and, quote, the form of society which utilizes these instruments and their ideas. Mm. The mm. instrument of labor, when it takes the form of a machine, immediately becomes a competitor of the workman himself, which is what the Luddites God, feared, was that the so, machines would take over. So relevant today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is absolutely relevant today. So, quick side note. Historiography. Uh -huh. You ever studied historiography? No. So, historiography is the history of history. Okay. So, it's sort of like, um, it's like how you see history. So, you okay. can look at an event in history through a feminist lens yes a feminist um, lens or a socialist lens mm -hmm. or a capitalist lens and you can get a different reading off different events cool so if you view these events through a pro-capitalist lens mm -hmm. you just see the luddites as a bunch of disgruntled outsiders who were small-minded and backwards and incapable of embracing the great new technological changes that were going to save us all but if you look at this through any kind of anti-capitalist lens regardless <laughs> of what economic framework you believe should replace that yeah or political framework should control it it's the story of workers resisting the degradation of their role in society. Yes. They're not opposed to the technology in principle, but opposed to low wages and social disruption it brings. Yes. And the complete imbalance of power between factory owners and factory workers. Yes. Which I think is something we're facing now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> which is why I was so keen to the Luddites, because I just, so much of what we talk about at the moment is the future of automation mm -hmm. and AI mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how that's going to affect people's jobs because they're like, yeah. oh, robots will take all our jobs. It's like, this is exactly what the Luddites were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Technology will take your job and there is no framework in place for how we are going to deal with no. an entirely unemployed workforce. Like, and it's the whole workforce too. Yeah. It's not just unskilled workers. Mm -hmm. It's everybody because robots are really smart. Yes, exactly. 
So it's also like what we're facing now in terms of the whole like division of wealth and the 1% Mm -hmm. because that was where that really began. Like obviously there was the class system in the UK already, Mm -hmm. but that's when the master was the 1% and he owned everything and owned the means of production and the workers had nothing. No power. Nothing. Yeah. But yeah, I just, it's so similar to the problem we're facing now. And talking of things that you and I have been doing lately, Mm, we went to the uh, something something book fair. (laughs) The Socialist Book Fair? (laughs) Socialist Book Fair (laughs) on May the 5th. And I listened to a talk called Work and the Gig Economy. Yes. And they had these three amazing authors chat about their opinions on the future of work, basically. And so there was a lot of chat about universal basic income, which I find really fascinating. And the woman who wrote that book was called Annie Miller. And she pointed out that automation could be a good thing that might leave us with more time to do like grow our own food and develop yes. skills and work Stop on crafts. Yeah. Work on craft skills, which could lead us full circle back to the Luddites. <gasps> People working on small scale yes. artisan projects yes. in a way that the Luddites did. My I kind of thought it was hilarious. She didn't mention the Luddites specifically, but she mentioned people working on yeah. small scale artisan style craft projects. And I was just wow. like, I like the Luddites. <laughs> amazing. Yes. Full circle. Full circle. So it could be a good thing, but we have to look at the effect that automation will have on workers and put systems in yeah. place to support people yeah. so that you don't starve. Starve. <laughs> so you don't leave people with nothing yeah. to fulfill them. Like you said, like yeah. that, so that people don't have an absence of joy. Yeah. So we all have purpose and yeah. happiness in our lives. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I think the Luddites are absolutely fascinatingly they relevant are. to today. Yes. And I, the term is funny and easy to use in conversation, but it just it raises such shouldn't. a fascinatingly helpful history. It does. <laughs> yes. You just blew my mind. I, thank that you. I blew amazing. my own mind. Um, I'm going to leave you with a quote from oh, also yes. from Annie Miller. Uh, not from Governor <laughs> Ludd. What's his name? General <laughs> Ludd. General Ludd. Sadly, no. But Annie Miller said, technology is neutral, but the people who control it are not. Ooh. Right? Yes. And that's the thing. The Luddites were neutral about the technology, angry at the people who controlled it. And the only way to get their attention was to smash the technology itself. Bam! Yes. Ellie, what are you going to tell me about today? Well, Claire, in contrast to your devastatingly (laughs) fascinating history of the Luddites, I'm going to tell you about the very, very boring history of Reading. (laughs) maligned Reading. A much maligned <laughs> town, as they say. Have you have you ever been to Reading, Claire? I have been to Reading once, Ellie. And when was that? To see you. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> uh, I lived in Reading. You did indeed. For a bit. Reading has... Oh, sorry, you guys. Everything I know about it comes from you being oh. like, Claire. Well, Reading. <laughs> you're about to learn Get me more. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so... Reading is in the county of Berkshire, Mm. spelt Berkshire, and it took me a really long time to work that one out because I'm Australian (laughs) and that was tough. It lies about 40 miles or 64 kilometres west of London. It has a population of 218,000 people or thereabouts, Mm. and for a while, yeah, one of them was me. (laughs) (laughs) So I lived in Reading in 2015 and... I have to be honest, I thought it was pretty boring. Pretty, pretty boring. People don't really move for all the way from Australia mm-hmm. to the UK to live in Reading. No. And I, it's I, just, it's yeah. neither of the extremes. It's not a huge, big yes. city like London or Or Edinburgh. a tiny, cute town. Exactly. Yeah. So the reason I lived in Reading was because I got a job at the River and Rowing Museum in Henley-on-Thames. It was a cracking little museum. Is that- Yes, it is indeed a cracker of a museum. It has a lot of boats, a lot of wind in the willows paraphernalia. Yes. Uh, a lot of stuff about the, the River Thames. I learnt a lot about the Thames, for instance. Yes. The biggest animal on the River Thames. Do you want to guess what it might be? Is it the Queen? I mean, <laughs> when she's on it, I'm sure it is the Queen. But- it's that elephant from the Frost Bear episode. <laughs> Again, <laughs> when, when he's there. When he's there. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it's swans. Oh, murder birds. Murder birds. They are big birds. They're massive. Murderous. 
So, yeah, so I was working in this tiny, tiny town, but I didn't want to live in the tiny, tiny town because it was super posh and super expensive. Yeah. So I lived with some really lovely housemates, actually, in Reading. Um, and, yeah, Reading was a bit grim, as they say. <laughs> so it was. It was. The one time I stayed there with you, it rained the whole oh, time. Did it? Oh, God, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. I had a lovely time <laughs> catching up with you, but I just remember that, like, we went out that evening and it just rained. Yeah. <laughs> it was very Which rainy, is very actually. British of it. Oh, yeah. So. Well, that's the thing about Reading. I think it is probably the most British place. <laughs> it's just, like, the most average British place in nice. all of the UK. Yeah. I think. So, in some ways, you had opinion. a very quintessentially British experience that you exactly. wouldn't have had anywhere else. Not a romantic British experience. No. Just, just a, a run-of-the-mill, average, beans-on-toast yes. British experience. Exactly that. So a lot of people have felt this way about Reading, Claire. It's not not just me. I'm not just being an absolute arsehole. I mean, I am being an arsehole. But you're allowed to be. You lived through it. Well, yeah, for like six months. <laughs> you lived through that, though. So I, I was really bored when I lived in Reading because I had no money. The mm. River and Rowing Museum, surprisingly, did not pay me very much. Oh. Um, and so... And I had a lot of time because I was only working three days a week. So I used to just wander around Reading and I went to the town hall a lot because they had a free gallery and a free museum. And in the town hall with some of my not very much money, I bought a book called A Much Maligned Town. That's why I keep saying that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it's it's a compilation of opinions about Reading. Opinions about Reading. Opinions is a very generous word. That's from so funny. Alep- they couldn't even say like nice musings about Reading because oh, no. no one had been no, to exactly. say. No, exactly. Oh. So it goes from 1126 to 2008. So it's almost a thousand years of opinions wow. <laughs> about Reading. So I'm going to walk you through yes. a history okay. of Reading with some handy quotes from this handy book. Lovely. Um, and a few other quotes from some handy people who... Uh, exciting and surprising that you might not Ooh, know okay, have great. had a connection with Reading. So, because yeah, I know nothing about it except that you lived there. <laughs> <laughs> well, buckle up, Claire. Oh, let's go. You thought the Luddites were exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on Reading. <laughs> get ready. Oh my God, get ready. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> that should be their town slogan. It really should. Let's write to them. Yes. Okay. So. The first evidence of Reading as a settlement dates from the 8th century, which, as we discussed the other day, would be the 700s. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I get very confused. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And our friend Wikipedia says the name Reading comes from Reddingus, which is an Anglo-Saxon tribe whose name means reader's people. So I guess they had a leader called a reader cool. and they were his people you are one of his people now eleanor oh gosh i am i'm a reddinger well yes. i was for a while <laughs> um so after the battle of hastings william the conqueror our mate will gave land in and around reading for the building of an abbey oh yeah it's very exciting so reading abbey was officially founded in 1121 by william the conqueror's son henry the first and I just, I just want to talk a tiny bit about Henry the First. Yes, I don't have a lot of context for him. He's funny. I think he's funny. <laughs> anyway, so, so he was William the Conqueror's son, and he kind of got the crown. I think he had brothers, and they died, and he got the crown in like yeah. quite a roundabout way. But once he was king, he like he ruled for a really long time. But the most that people remember about him is that he really, really liked to eat eels. Like lampreys. Wow, what a yeah. great legacy. <laughs> and I see why you mean funny. <laughs> but he was allergic to them. Oh my god! So he just he just kept eating them even though he was allergic. Didn't have an EpiPen even. Nope. It hadn't been invented. Um, just kept just kept eating the eels. <laughs> and one day in eleven thirty five, when he was about sixty seven, he just ate too many and he died of eels. Died of eels. <laughs> Cause of death eels. <laughs> So that's Henry the First, but you know, apart from the eels, he founded Reading Abbey, is and this he's the buried there. Abbey, oh, he's buried at the Abbey. Mm, yeah, sweet. Um, is this the Abbey that is it? Pillars of the Earth is based on. Oh, is it that I don't because it's around that time. I mean, it might be. Yeah, actually, I did think a little bit about Pillars of the Earth when I was mm. reading this because I think Henry the First features in 
pillars. Yeah. I think he's the king that dies, and then he sends all of England into chaos because yes. he didn't have any. His son died in a boating accident. Well, not he was like trying yeah. to get to France, and he died. So I don't think he had any like direct heirs. Right. So that's that is exactly the time when pillars of the earth is. Yeah. Set. So I wonder how much that Reading Abbey inspired the Abbey in that book. Well, they're probably or building the a lot of cathedrals. True. Around then. True. Yeah. Let's say that is a contribution Reading made sure. to British let's, culture. Let's give so. it to them. Let's give that one to Reading. <laughs> it's a freebie for you, Reading. So we start off with actually quite a nice quote because at the start, people were quite into Reading. Oh, that's good. Um, it's so, in a beautiful part of the world. It's very pretty. Well, it's between... Okay, I'll read you, I'll read you this little quote. So this is from William of Malmesbury. Um, circa 1126. So this is the first quote, the first written quote about Reading ever. Wow. Henry I built this monastery between the rivers Kennet and Thames in a spot calculated for the reception of almost all who might have occasion to travel to the most populous cities in England, where he placed monks of the Cluniac order, who are at this day a noble pattern of holiness and an example of unwearied and delightful hospitality. So yeah, it sounds quite nice, and it probably was quite nice at the time. Let's mm-hmm. let's say that. Um, and there's another cute thing about Reading. So one of the first songs ever written in English was maybe composed at Reading Abbey. They, cool. They found it at Reading Abbey. So it was maybe composed there. It was also maybe composed somewhere else, and they just <laughs> brought, found, to the Abbey. brought to the Abbey. Um, but it's called Summer is a Coming In. And it's really cute. It just means like spring is springy. I know. I just I love it when you say Summer things in old English. Like you do it so well. <laughs> I did a course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the earliest no, it's the earliest known six part harmony from Britain. And I wish I knew cool. anything about music to tell you what that. Uh, yeah, I have to Neither. ask Jamie. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> So, yeah, it's quite a cute, jaunty little song. It's a round as well. So it does the, like, oh, yep. lay, I guess it must layer six six goes of the round. Cool. Maybe into a harmony. If anyone knows anything about music <laughs> and would like to tell us, please, please call do. in. <laughs> please call in now. And or email us. At oh, my God, how creepy would it be if someone called? It'd <laughs> be super creepy. <laughs> okay, so because of its royal patronage, so, because Henry I um, founded it, yes. it had royal patronage. Abbey was one of the hot pilgrimage spots in medieval Europe. Sweet. So, they had, like, I wonder mm. if Marjorie Kemp ever went there. Oh, my God, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Was it the same time? No. Well, she's she's on the 1300s. Well, it went through till the 1500s. Right. So, buildings last longer than they, people. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> so, it would have been around at, at the time oh, when she was cool. alive. Maybe she did. Yes. Marjorie, tell us. How, how, how did you like Reading? <laughs> did you enjoy it? Is there a quote from Marjorie Kemp? <laughs> Not in this book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was one of the largest monasteries in Europe and the fourth largest church in Britain. So, oh. yeah, maybe Pillars of the earth E. Um, mm. So, building went on for almost 200 years. Oh, Lord. After the foundation in 1121. So, it was founded in 1121, but it took them, like, 200 years to it's finish. It's insane when things take that long to be built that anything fucking got finished. I know. It's incredible. The dedication. Yes. M- miraculous. I know we've mentioned it like a thousand times already, but Pillars of the Earth is a great yeah. novel for it's awesome. seeing the scope and the perspective of mm-hmm. that. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So good. Um, so the Abbey owned the town of Reading and the Abbot was its lord. Hey, 51% of this town. <laughs> how it worked sometimes yeah because so, then they got like all the food and taxes yeah. and that's how they make money and maintain shit and yeah, yeah. so it get kind of like in pillars of the earth yes. i think the <laughs> abbot was the leader of the town yeah. as well and sometimes that wasn't that wasn't always the case like sometimes there would be a mayor of the town mm. as well who was not a religious person and then you have to negotiate with the abbot and stuff like that yeah but in reading the abbot was the lord but i think that's how like a, a lot of the like Downton Abbey yeah. was an abbey. And so a lot of the oh, like yeah. lords then took over abbeys huh. or they had abbeys attached. And there's a whole complex like history of how the church and the like peerage system interplay. Mm. Yeah. That sounded so smart, Claire. You're welcome. I mean, I don't actually know how it fucking works. I just know that it's very messily connected somehow. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So 
I have walked around the ruins of Reading Abbey Ooh. on a very exciting tour. It's a lazy you... pilgrimage. <laughs> yeah, so go down the road. <laughs> well, there wasn't a lot to do in Reading, as we discussed. <laughs> So, yeah, the Reading City Council organises tours of the ruins. Cool. You have to wear a hard hat because it's pretty, Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, like, quite ruined. And I'm about to tell you why it oh, was a what ruin. what happened? Well, Henry VIII happened. Oh, of bum, course bum, he did. Bum. So, our friend Henry closed Reading Abbey in 1539 and took all of its valuable possessions and executed the abbot, oh. whose name was Hugh Cook Farringdon. Oh, poor Hugh. I uh, know, poor Hugh. Um, and this was all part of the dissolution of the monasteries, uh, which yes. uh, was this thing that Henry did when he declared himself the head of the Church of England. He was just like, yeah, cool, give me all your stuff, mm. monasteries. Because they had all this gold and stuff. And I mean, they did. Of Jesus and stuff. They, they had bits of all sorts of people. Yeah. And he wanted those bits. <laughs> so this is what uh, Reading was like at around about the time that Henry VIII dissolved the abbey. Just see him pouring acid over it, but oh, continue. I mean, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> this little town, for the neatness of its streets and the fineness of its buildings, for its riches and the reputation it hath gotten for making cloth, goes beyond all the other towns in this county. I mean, that's Berkshire, so it's not a very big county, but still. Thank you, William Camden in Britannia from cool. 1586. So nice. still, still sounds nice. We're still getting positive quotes about Reading. Positive How long Reading. will it last? <laughs> <laughs> um, so after Henry VIII dissolved the abbey, he made it into a royal palace, um, right. which was quite nice until the Civil War. Oh, God. Bow, bow, bow. Does yeah. the city ever get to just chill? <laughs> no. Reading, Reading has not had a chill time of oh. history. <laughs> So the English Civil War ran from 1642 to 1651. Do you, do you know much about the English Civil War? Mm, Cromwell, something, something. Yeah, well, yeah, it's about it. <laughs> well, I'll give you a teeny tiny potted history. So basically it was between the parliamentarian roundheads, of which Cromwell was mm. one, and the royalists under Charles I and then Charles II. Yeah. And they were called the Cavaliers. So basically what happened is Charles I was all like, I have a divine right to rule. Parliament, you should do whatever I say. And Parliament was like, mm, yeah, but we've got all the money and all the power, so no. And then that kept going and it kept going and it kept going. And eventually there was a civil war and Charles I lost the civil war and then they cut off his head. It was all Awkward. pretty dramatic. <laughs> but yeah, the war was brutal. I think a lot of people died and it was awful. Um, and Reading held a strategic position in the war because mm. it was halfway between London, which is where the roundheads or the parliamentarians were, and Oxford, which is where Charles I had his base. Oh. So yeah, Charles I based himself in Reading for a bit, I think before moving to Oxford. And the roundheads lay siege to Reading in 1643. And in order to defend themselves, the Cavaliers or the Royalists picked apart the Abbey <laughs> to oh. make battlements and then to, like, throw bits of Abbey at the So here when you hear about history destroying other bits of history. <laughs> Weird, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah, they really, they kind of fucked the Abbey. Um, so now there's really not a lot left. Oh. It's totally After 200 ruined. I used no. to build, and in one battle it's like... Which eh. means it was so 1126 to... 15, what did I say? 15... Something. 1539. So that they only really got a good 300 years use out of it. Such a shame. It is a shame. It's a lot of... All those poor workers. No, all those master masons. <laughs> so I have a quote from our favourite guy, Samuel Pepys. Aww. Who, of course he went to Reading. He visited Reading a little bit after the Civil War. And of Reading, he says, And in the evening the times came to Reading, and there heard my wife read more of Mustafa. No idea what that is. Then to supper, and then I to walk about the town, which is a very great one, I think bigger than Salisbury. A river runs through it in several branches and unite in one, in one part of the town, and runs into the Thames. That's, I'd call that a neutral, <laughs> a neutral, neutral review. Well, Pepys is famous for his view. Like he's giving us a view on daily life. He totally. doesn't really give. He's not rave reviewer, really. No, is he? He's although more he just liked like, your um, Punch, Punch and Judy. Judy. He did, yeah. yeah. So Punch and Judy is ahead of Reading right now <laughs> in the Samuel Pepys ranking of British things. Totally. <laughs> but then Daniel Defoe loved Reading. 
He says it's a very large and wealthy town, handsomely built. The inhabitants rich and driving a very great trade. So that's from 1724, about a hundred years after oh, Peeps. So it's quite. A, so I guess we're getting south, lots so of positive. Definitely wealthy. Yeah, well, yeah. Ri- <laughs> richer than the north. Oh dear, <laughs> cut that, please. No, cut I'm that. keeping oh, in every no. bit of rich Armitage I can. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Okay, so now this is going to surprise you, I think. Jane Austen spent 18 months at school in Reading. No way! Yep, between 1785 and 1786. She went to the Reading Ladies Boarding School. Um, There's a really cute quote from her mum, which says, Jane was too young to make her going to school at all necessary, but she would go with Cassandra, that's her big sister. If Cassandra's head was going to be chopped off, Jane would have hers cut off too. (laughs) Comparison of going to Reading being the same as execution. (laughs) Oh, that's so cute. It's so cute. And here's where we start to get slightly more negative reviews of Reading because, as you and I both know, Jane Austen is kind of cutting. Yeah. She's um, (laughs) notoriously cutting. She's notoriously cutting. So I have this quote from Emma, which people think is probably about Reading. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So they've, they've sort of said that. She took inspiration from her time at Reading (laughs) Ladies Boarding School to write this. So in Emma, in the town that Emma lives in, there is a boarding school run by a Mrs. Goddard. And there's a lovely description of it. It says, A real, honest, old-fashioned boarding school where a reasonable quantity of accomplishments were sold at a reasonable price and where girls might be sent to be out of the way and scramble themselves into a little education without any danger of coming back prodigies. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Mrs. Scott, I was just trying her best, Jane. (laughs) Don't be mean, Jane. Um, So she didn't love it. (laughs) Didn't love it. But um, out of the way. She was out of the way and it was all right. It wasn't shit. It wasn't awful. Um, So by the time Austin was in Reading, it had a population of about 9,400 people and it was growing real fast. So in the 19th century, Reading became a manufacturing centre. I wonder if there are any Luddites in Reading. I don't know. Didn't see that. See how far south it spread. So we're starting with 9,400 in the early 19th century. Then by 1851, the population rose to 21,000. And then by 1900, the population was at 59. 9,000. and Stop having babies. I know. So, well, I think there's people moving there. I mean, um, that would be a lot of babies. That would be an yeah. insane amount of babies. <laughs> but, you know, maybe people love boning in Reading because there's just nothing else to do. <laughs> well, actually, there are three things to do, Claire. Because by 1900... Is procreation one of them, though? No. <laughs> Not in the top three. Maybe it's number four. Cool. Because Reading had became famous for the three Bs. Beer, boning, boning, no, beer, bulbs, as in plants, okay, plant bulbs, like tulip bulbs, and biscuits. Delicious. This company called Huntley and Palmer's were big biscuit manufacturers. And then, yeah, number four is boning. Um, (laughs) A lot of the history books don't talk about that one. Um, So, yeah, in the 19th century, um, Reading had this massive boom and became a centre of industry. And in the 19th century as well, Boating had become really popular on the River Thames. So boating, bulbs, <laughs> biscuits. What was the other one? The first boning. one? Boning. Boning. Beer? Beer. Beer. Yeah. <laughs> the five essential the five bees. bees. <laughs> um, so all these like posh people would go on boating trips down the River Thames. Oh, Have you heard of three men in a boat? I mean, I've probably heard of three <laughs> Men in a boat, but I think we're probably thinking of different things. I think we are, because there's so there's a book from like the 1890s called Three Men in a Boat, and it's basically the description of a trip down the River Thames. Oh, nice. I think from not heard of this. maybe Oxford to London or something like that. Um, and people people didn't like going through Reading because it spoiled the atmosphere. Oh, so I've got Redding. this is when the negative quotes really come into play. <laughs> So I have a quote from a book called uh, From Paddington to Penzance, which I'm guessing is a travel journal. We came to Reading prepared for anything but charm in that town of biscuits. <laughs> biscuits. And we were... 
Sorry. It's all right. You don't. If I was going to go to a town of biscuits, I'd be so excited. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> well, they were not prepared for charm, charm in that town of biscuits. Um, and we were not inclined to alter our ready-made opinion upon the sight of it. We passed through double quick, leaving the last of the town as late as 8.30. He who runs may read, perhaps, if the type be sufficiently large, but I don't think he would find it possible to write. We did not. And so this book must go forth lacking a description of Reading. That's rude. That just sounds yeah. like you went in with some preconceived mm-hmm. notions about somewhere mm-hmm. and didn't even try to eat the delicious biscuits yeah. and yeah, change your Claire. mind. You defend yeah. it. Yeah. Fiona hate it. Hate it for real reasons. Well, now we've got some <laughs> real reasons. Okay. <laughs> So this is from Three Men in a Boat, which is from 1889. So sorry, not the 1890s, 1889. We came in sight of Reading about 11. The river is dirty and dismal here. One does not linger in the neighbourhood of Reading. The town itself is a famous old place, dating from the dim days of Ethelred, when the Danes anchored their warships in the Kennet, maybe, I don't know, and started from Reading to ravage all the lands of Wessex. And here, Ethelred and his brother Alfred fought and defeated them. Actually, that is true. So Alfred the Great defeated the Danes at Reading. Cool. I really should have said that at the start. It's pretty important. So Alfred <laughs> the Great is the first king of England. Cool. Yeah. So another interesting thing about Reading, and maybe a bit of a sad thing about Reading, is that Oscar Wilde was imprisoned there. Oh. Did you know that? I never knew he was in- Oh, of course. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know he was in prison in Reading, though. Yeah, yeah, he was. And it was pretty brutal. So oh. he was um, he was imprisoned for homosexual offences. Oh. So this is the whole thing with Bosie. And yeah. Bosie's dad t- took him to trial. And it was horrible. And he was dragged through the dirt. And then he was sentenced to two years of hard labour. Oh. It was just awful. That's gross. Um, and he was in Reading. And he had a horrible time. Um, and a lot of people think it killed him. You know, I hate Reading again. Yeah. Fair. Um, but he wrote a beautiful, really, really touching poem about Reading Jail called The Ballad of Reading Jail. And it's about a man. He, he, while he was there, he saw a man hanged. Um, he witnessed a hanging. Jesus. And it really distressed him of course as Mm. it would um i'll just read a little bit of that because this is definitely um not a positive quote about reading in reading jail by reading town there is a pit of shame and in it lies a wretched man eaten by teeth of flame in burning winding sheet he lies and his grave has got no name very sad wow so he wrote that after he was released from jail Mm. and he was in exile in france and then he died really soon after that. It's really sad and really awful. So that's pretty sad. All right. We're, we're nearing the end, Claire. The end of Reading. The Reading's end of over. Reading. So in the 20th century, we get some real bad reviews of Reading. So my favourite, um, from Cyril Connolly from The Unquiet Grave in 1948, we have angst begins at Reading. <laughs> so, uh, I feel like you identify with I that really quote very strongly. That is where my angst began. <laughs> um, this one's cute. Uh, this is from J. H. B. Peel in Portrait of the Thames from 1967. Of Reading itself, I shall say only this that during the 19th century it suffered an acute attack of prosperity from which it has never recovered. (laughs) Um, But then the best quote I have is by... Now, I I don't actually know if we know who wrote this. It's from 1968, and it's from the Caversham Park Village magazine. So Caversham is a suburb of Reading, Mm. which is over the river, and it's posh. So it's like the other side of the Thames, and it's like the nice bit of Reading. (laughs) Um, and this is in the village voice. <clears throat> Reading must be the deadliest, dullest, most boring dragsville with the powers and dignity of a country borough and seat of a university anywhere south of Reykjavik. <laughs> Bam! Because one thing, positive. I don't know if you're going to bring this up, mm. but one thing that you told me about Reading is that they can't become a capital Oh, yes, this is city. so sad. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I find it's hilarious. so tragic. So I didn't include this because, I don't know why I didn't, it's silly, it's ridiculous. So Reading keeps applying to be a city, 
Yeah. So they're a town. That's, sorry, not a capital city. Yeah, yeah just a city. Just a city. Because they're yes. massive. I mean, they've got, a what did I say? A population 200, of 200,000 people. That's insane. That's... They keep being refused city status because they don't have a cathedral. Because no! Henry VIII knocked it down. Henry VIII ah! is like the thorn in Everyone Reading hates side. Henry VIII. It's <laughs> a big problem. Ah, oh, still so, fucking yeah. shit up from beyond the grave. It is tragic. <laughs> Poor so, Reading. I know, poor Reading. But I'm gonna I'm gonna oh. finish with three little facts. Um, the first is that Reading has the longest railway viaduct in the UK. Woo! Woo! <laughs> it's two thousand meters long. Which How about cooler that? Cooler than the one that Harry Potter goes oh, across so to get cooler. to Hogwarts. So much cooler. longer. Yeah. So better. Definitely longer yeah. and better. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is Reading Football Club is officially football's unluckiest team. <laughs> that does not shock me at all. <laughs> but it's only because they're the only team to finish. So do you know much about football? Because no. I don't. All right. So you know how there's the Premier League, which yes. is like Arsenal and Manchester Chelsea. United. And, yeah, all the fancy teams. Yeah. Below the Premier League, there's a league called the – oh, God. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this. <laughs> oh, no. I think it's called the – first tier right um and that's like the, the tier below the premier league right. i'm so sorry british listeners it's <laughs> awful um so usually when you come first or second when you're yeah. in that second tier you get bumped up to the premier league right and you get to play with all the exciting right. teams but <laughs> reading is the only football team to finish second in the first tier but not get promoted to the Premier League because they reduced the Premier League numbers by one the year that they came wow. second. Wow. <laughs> That's brutal. Oh, so close yet so far. So far. <laughs> and for my third fact, I'm going to bring in a friend. Oh, guest of the podcast. This is our first guest. So exciting. So, Claire and listeners, this is my friend Beth from Australia. Hi, hi Beth. Beth. Oh, hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome to uh, School Britannia. Now, you're here to tell us the third interesting fact about Reading. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was a bit worried that this might actually be too interesting. Um, <laughs> and blow us both out of the water. I mean, I've absolutely had a field day researching this. Um, so I'm very into language, love yes. language. Beth is a linguist. Yes. Mm. And this is just something that I can't believe I had no idea that occurred. So I guess what made me research this was Ellie, you've been talking about <laughs> Reading. Reading. <laughs> Exciting um, Reading. Yeah. And of course, as a linguist, I'm like, gosh, it's obviously spelt reading or yeah. how we would say, you know, I've been reading this book. And it turns out the reason that we say reading and not reading mm -hmm. is because of this thing called the Great Vowel Chain. Whoa! Yes! Yes, which I, it does ring a bell, but I've just never had any reason to really look into it in depth. Mm. But today, well, that was reason enough. <laughs> um, so the phrase is coined by this Danish linguist mm -hmm. called Otto Jespersen. Mm -hmm. um, and this was around the late 1800s. And essentially he claims, or not just not just Otto, a lot of people say <laughs> that during the 1400s to the 1700s, a huge change occurred um, in the way that we now pronounce the English language. Ah. Um, so for those who weren't aware, the 1400s is when Middle English started transitioning into our more contemporary English Ooh, that we have cool. today. Yeah, so essentially the reason um, that this happened, there's kind of two, it's, it's all a bit debatable, but there's I would say probably both of these are influences um, as to why we started changing the pronunciation of um, vowels. Uh, the first is that um, they saw, um, historians can see that the change happened in the south mm. of England um, and then made its way up. And at that time, which I know you both are all very knowledgeable on, <laughs> it was the Black Death. Oh, no! Yes! So this was, uh, they say that the migrants which were coming from the north and working their way down to the south, that influenced the change in pronunciation because in the oh. north of England, oh. they had much longer vowels versus the posh London, you know, oh. tight vowels T, etc. <laughs> happened. Thank you. That was really very good. To put that Excellent. On. Um, so yeah. So that's that's theory number one. Yeah. Um, the other theory is that that time um, things are obviously not going so well with the English and French relations. Have they ever? I mean, <laughs> I know. So um, this was the period in which the aristocrats in um, England transitioned from speaking French 
to oh, English. Yeah. And as we always see when these things happen is that, you know, the upper class are doing one thing, the middle class or the lower class want to do another. So the middle class really embraced French mm. um, and those who I guess had influence on things, um, the higher up classes kind of did their best to push away from sounding anything whatsoever to do with France. Really? Exactly. Wow. So they really, so what you'll see, I'm sure Ellie, you would know with your lovely French, <laughs> is that French doesn't really have many diphthongs. It's got no. a lot of tight, short vowels. Yeah. Um, and What's so a diphthong? It's a, like a, you go, you're oh, the leader. No, no, it's like, so a diphthong is something that has two parts to it. So versus a monothong, which would be like eh, a diphthong would be like uh, wait, a eh. so your uh, mouth moves into two places. Cool. So it starts at the front and moves to the back. Um, so French don't really do that. They're very tight, short vowels. Um, and so we start seeing this transition occur. Oh. So things like house, which was the English house, became house, much more elongated. Oh, diphthongy. So, exactly. Wow. So we're moving from short to longer vowels. Um, nice. So, yeah, obviously really interesting. So something like um, I think my other example was Bought became boat. So, bought, uh, boat, things oh. like that. So, of course, we see red become reading. reading. Uh -huh. Is it that place names really stick? So, they stuck with reading each other? Totally. Word? In any other context, that would be oh, reading. Exactly. It, I mean, it's one thing to change like a verb or just like a noun, but to change a proper noun, like the name yeah. of a town, that's much harder to do. So, that's why we have. Reading. Beth! Wow! Isn't that fascinating? Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Welcome. Thank you for being our first guest on the podcast. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for having me. That was great. <laughs> I hope I didn't just, you know, bore you all down with my fun fact. No. You did. You blew us both out of the water. <laughs> yeah. So, if you want to hear more history tidbits, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate, review, and subscribe. And tell other history buffs all about us. If you want to know what sources we used, please go to our SoundCloud page. The link is in the description. And today's homework is never go to Reading. Reading.